the Lincoln University Cooperative Extension Paula D. Carter Center on Minority Health and Aging. Before we actually begin, I need to make sure that our sites are connected. And let's start with Carruthersville. Are you connected, Carruthersville? Yes. Well, good morning. Great. Um, let's, let's move up. I'll come back to you, you guys a little later. Let's move up the virtual highway to Learbrook. Are you connected, Learbrook? Miss Ruth, are you there? I'm thinking, I tried to call the office and nobody answered the phone this morning, so I'm thinking they're not on. Well, we will continue up to Saxton. Saxton, are you connected? Yes, we're connected. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep moving. St. Louis, good morning. Are you connected? St. Louis? They're, they might have their mic muted. Yeah. Good morning, St. Louis. There we go. Oh, great. We're connected. Good. <laughs> Let's keep moving. We'll come back to Gibson City, of course. Kansas City. Good morning, Kansas City. Kansas City. Going once, going twice, Kansas City. Yeah. Yes, I hear the Kansas City. All right, thank you, Kansas City. <laughs> okay. All right, since everyone is connected, I need to go around one more time again because I want the facilitators to announce who they are and the number of participants per their site. Let's go back to Carruthersville. The facilitator at your site is Carruthersville. Rose goes here. She's it. I'm asking for the facilitator for the site. Okay, what do you mean? When you say facilitator, I am meaning who is the staff person there in charge? George and And Don George is our how many participants are there? We have uh, four participants. Thank you, Carruthersville. <coughs> Let's move up and try Liberty again. Miss Ruth, are you there? Let's be on moving. Sykeston, the facilitator for Sykeston. Can Hollowell. Good morning, Mr. Hollowell. How many participants do you have at uh, the Sison site? Seven participants at Sison. Yes. Thank you. Let's keep moving. St. Louis. The facilitator for the St. Louis area is. Can you hear us, sir? Yes. Mr. George okay. Biddle, are you the facilitator for St. Louis? Yes. All yes. righty, good. I'm the facilitator for St. Louis. And uh, right now our screens are black. So uh, we just wondered if you could see or hear us. Actually, we. Mm. You can hear us, but uh, our screens are black. So. Mm. It's rebooting. Okay. Okay. Thank you, St. Louis. Kansas City? The facilitator for Kansas, Kansas City. Kansas City. The facilitator is Byron, but he had to step out of the room, so Arthur Jackson Jr. is facilitating right now. Well, all right. That's all right, too. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. And we make it work. We make it work in Kansas City. Um, I see. <laughs> well, we don't have We have. We have 23 participants. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Kansas City. All right. 
Well, here it looks like we have about how many participants? Does any of the staff do an end count? Well, almost 20. So that's wonderful. It's really wonderful that uh, you came out to participate for this wonderful topic that we're going to be discussing today. Before I introduce our speaker who is a part of the LU family, I would also like for our partner from the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, Office of Minority Health, Ms. Valerie Butler, to give a greeting. <laughs> From the Office of Minority Health, Department of Health and Senior Services, I extend your greetings to this lunch and learn. Uh, welcome everyone. We hope you gain some knowledge that help you in your everyday life uh, as we age on. Thank you, and have a good day. Before I introduce our presenter, I would like to share some information. Dr. Walter Cal Johnson, Jr. earned his Ph.D. in psychology with a focus on counseling from the Department of Psychology at the University of Missouri-Columbia in 1997. After working for five years with the Department of Residential Life on the MU campus, conducting assessment on the development of learning communities, then integrated students' residential experience with academic achievement, Dr. Johnson joined the faculty of Lincoln University in the fall of 2002. He was involved for two years with the development of Beyond the Front, an interactive DVD about suicide prevention for the U.S. Army through the Center for Suicide Prevention Research and Studies on the LU campus. Dr. Johnson considers his main professional identity to be science educator, helping students to understand the process and useful application of the principles of scientific inquiry to the topics of human behavior and experience. His interest areas include personality development, abnormal psychology, test and measurements, and the history of psychology as a distinct field of inquiry. Dr. Johnson, has served as the department head for the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences since 2008. Other interests include drawing, haunting, a wide variety of music, and history. Please welcome Dr. Walter Cal Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, humbled and uh, feel privileged to be with you today. Um, Ms. Jenkins told me that this was going to be statewide, but I didn't really know how statewide it was going to be. Uh, um, you know, looking at this crowd, this does not seem to be really a depression prone crowd. So, uh, if, uh, you know, I, uh, I feel good about the information I have to share with you today. And I'm, I hope that it is at least enlightening. Um, and having said that, we'll start. Do, does everybody see the slides on the paper or do we see them up on the screen as well? You can switch over. Uh, is it on the laptop? I can see it on the laptop. Okay. We're high tech. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> the 
the way this works for me, uh, when when I talk about a topic in front of a group, um, and you know, usually I'm in front of a classroom, uh, two classfuls of of Lincoln students three times a week, and um, often I have I get to go over the material more than once. And uh, I put together my material, and then I continue to think about it, and think about things that I wish that I'd put in. Uh, and when I was putting these slides together, I was really thinking about our topic in terms of uh, being one of the depressions. Um, but it doesn't have to reach that level. It doesn't have to reach that level. One of the things that I think is just really powerful about this knowledge is just a just acknowledging that the time of the year has a big impact on how we feel. And um, it doesn't have to reach the level of a diagnosable depression to have an effect on us. When we think about seasonal affective disorders, the way the, the psychologists and the psychiatrists think about seasonal affective disorder is that it's a, a subtype of depression. It's a subtype of depression. And what makes it different than other kinds of depression is that it's really tied to the time of the year. Um, it doesn't have an official in the book diagnosis, but enough research has been done about it that the people who do research uh, say, okay, we're going to call this seasonal affective disorder if we get two episodes of depression, either in the same year or two years, one after the other, um, at the same time of the year. Usually comes on in fall or winter and goes away during spring and summer. So to talk about it as a subtype of depression, it's useful to go over what we call depression. Now, we all know that all of us have our ups and downs, that uh, life throws us bunches of challenges, uh, we go through periods where things don't look so bright, and that's normal. And, you know, we lose somebody we love, or something bad happens, and we feel sad, we go through a period of mourning, and that's normal. Um, Really, it becomes sort of an identifiable problem if it goes on for a long period of time. And that's really how psychology and psychiatry and the medical fields say that's depression. So first off, you feel sad or depressed, just like the word says. You feel sad most of the day, nearly every day. And that's no fun. Sometimes for men, sometimes for men it shows up more as being irritable or cranky rather than sad. But it's most of the day, nearly every day, and really the, the time period that the doctors use for diagnosis is two weeks. So if you've got a two week period where you're down most of the day, every day, then you might start thinking about, I need to do something for myself. Uh, the other kinds of highlights are pleasure goes out of activities that used to be pleasurable. Um, somebody in the room here was showing pictures of a new grandbaby, and it was clear that she took a lot of pleasure in that, and other people did too. So it would be like, oh, I have a new grandbaby or a new great-grandbaby, and somehow I'm not excited about that. And that should be a sign. You know, because everybody, I think, would be excited. Um, significant weight gain or weight loss. You know, watching our weight is, um, is a big part of taking care of our health. I know I could always, uh, I, I wish I could shed about 20 right now. And um, it's not easy to do. Uh, feeling slow or lethargic. Just really, you know, sometimes if you feel like, boy, I don't have the energy I had just a couple of weeks ago, it's really harder 
to get out and do things is a sign. Um, fatigue, loss of energy. So, if you look at these three, significant weight gain or weight loss, feeling slower, lethargic, fatigue or loss of energy, um, those are sort of physical kinds of things that we would notice. Um, the feeling sad is more sort of a, you know, how I feel, how I talk about it. Feeling really bad about yourself, feeling that you're just not worth very much, or feeling guilty about things that really you wouldn't have any reason to feel guilty about would be a sign. Another one is trouble concentrating, and it's harder to get things done. Now, um, you know, again, all of these things sort of one at a time are going to be normal for us just in the course of our life, unless, unless we're blessed with the kind of temperament uh, that really keeps us up all the time. And if you're one of those people, acknowledge that as a blessing. Because that's not a gift that's given to everybody. Um, but it is a blessing. What really makes it worth paying attention to is if one of these things has changed for you or for someone close to you in the recent past. What makes it a, a medical condition is if you can say four weeks ago, I didn't feel this way, and now, for go going on two weeks, these things have changed. It's not just that they show up, it's that, it, boy, this is a significant change from how I was feeling before. <clears throat> and I want to continue to kind of, I, I wrote my slides, I put my slides together as thinking about seasonal affective disorder as a condition. And I want to continue to acknowledge that um, it, it, it happens at a not quite so critical level from time to time. And even if we don't have a very significant seasonal affective depression, a, we might see some of the signs of symptoms, and there might be some things that we can do for ourselves to lessen the impact of that. So seasonal affective disorder is, you know, that, that list of signs and symptoms that I just went over with you. It's like a checklist. And the doctors are going to say to call it the official condition, to give it the official diagnosis, we have to check off at least five of those. It's got to be all day, every day for two weeks or longer. It occurs in the fall and winter time and goes away in the spring and summer. That's what makes it seasonal affective disorder. We'll get back to depression as its own thing in a minute. And then there are four things that are kind of highlights especially of seasonal affective disorder. is increased need for sleep. Increased need for sleep. Craving carbohydrates. Craving the potatoes and the rice and the gravy and starches and sweets and the associated weight gain that goes with having more of those in our diet. Wanting to socially withdraw. You're all here in the room this morning. People all across the state are in different rooms this morning, so that's good you got out. Uh, to be with other people, um, and also increased anxiety. So, comes the fall, increased need for sleep, carbohydrate craving, that's fall, that's winter. Social withdrawal, increased anxiety, and feelings of sadness. So one of the, you know, as I was sort of thinking about it, well, let's go through this first.
here's the, it's really serious numbers, and here's the, the rest of us who might experience some of these things. So, the studies that have been done on seasonal affective depression show that it's either between a half of a percent to five percent of the population. Half of a percent to five percent of the population. So maybe one out of, some between one out of 200 people to five out of 100 people. But then when you start looking at that list of signs and symptoms and you don't check off all five, maybe you check three or four, then that number goes up to 10 to 20 percent of the population, which is a much larger number. 10 out of 100 people, 20 out of 100 people, is that starts to be a significant bunch of us. There's how many people in the room today? 30? 30, 30, 30 it looks like. So um, we wouldn't necessarily expect to find one person, but we might in this crowd that says, oh yeah, I can check off some of those things, and it, it happens in the spring and summer. Like all of the depressions, women are more susceptible than men. That's just true of all of the depressions. Um, and uh, my interpretation of the research is that that just, that has to do with some of the differences. Well, there's two things. One, the expectations and, and different things that people are allowed in terms of what we expect of men and women. And the other has to do with our biochemistry. Uh, men, the, of, of, the, of the neurochemicals that our nervous system runs on that so deeply impact the way we feel and think. Um, serotonin, serotonin is the neurotransmitter that's really associated with having a good mood. And if you compare men and women, Men have, on the average, 50% more serotonin in their system than women do. Men have this one particular neurotransmitter that's really, really important. Men, on the average, have 50% more than women. And other than testosterone and estrogen, other than the really sort of... Uh, gender sex related hormones, that's the biggest biological difference in terms of body chemistry between men and women. Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that women are more susceptible to depression than men. Because that is, that's the chemical that if you're feeling sad all day, every day, that's the one that your body's really probably going to be low in. Finally, the further north a person lives, the more likely they are to experience seasonal affective disorder. And uh, one of the things that occurred to me last night after I had uh, sent Ms. Jenkins my slides is that I wish that I had, I wish I had a, a globe. I wish I had a globe. Because I'm sure, but, but I'm sure that we all remember from geography class I'm sure that we all remember that from geography class, here's the equator, and here's the North Pole, and in Missouri, we're really right about here. We're pretty far north. We're pretty far north. We're just almost at 38 degrees latitude, and the farther north or the farther south somebody lives from the middle of the planet, the bigger the change in the amount of daylight as the fall comes on. So, after the, okay, the autumn equinox, September, 
22nd, 21st. We've got just about equal amounts of daylight and night. And then as we go further into the year, every day the amount of daylight gets a little bit shorter. And this affects our biology, including our brain chemistry, which most scientists think this, is, this really is at the root of why there's this subset of depression that happens in the winter and goes away in the spring. So I got on the internet and uh, I looked at this. I chose sort of the, the fall equinox as the start point because that's when we've got just about half daylight and half night. So on September 22nd, we've got just over 12 hours of daylight. But we've started to lose light already. We lose about two and a half minutes of sunlight every day beginning about September 1st through October 15th. So the change in the amount of daylight is really the fastest from about the beginning of September through the middle of October. So on September 22nd, um, the sun rises at 6.57 a.m. and sets at 7.05, so we've got about 12 hours of daylight. Not quite 10 days later, not quite 10 days later, we've got 20 minutes less of sunlight. When we get to the middle of October, now we're down to 11 hours and 11 minutes of sunlight. And on Halloween, we've gotten down below 11 hours. We're at 10 hours and 34 minutes of sunlight. Then, on Saturday night after Halloween, <coughs> We go into we go off at daylight savings time, which means that in terms of our, our sort of daily responsibilities, things get darker an hour earlier. It's it's a uh, I like it because um, and and one of the things that I was thinking about this is that boy I really get affected by this pattern. I'm I'm blessed in that I don't really necessarily get the depression part. But boy, I know that when September, October comes on, I gotta sleep more. I just gotta. Um, and getting up before the sun rises gets harder and harder to do. It's just easier to get up when the sun is already up. And so right before daylight savings time, the sun isn't coming up until 7.35. And then the next Sunday night, we kick it back an hour, so now the clock says the sun is rising at 6.39, but now it's setting at 5.05. .05. We're down to just about 10 and a half hours of sunlight. Um, we get to Thanksgiving. The sun, now it's not getting, it's not rising till about 7 as we're doing time. And it sets before 5 o'clock. We're down to under 10 hours of sunlight. And then... I really meant this to say, it says December 4th, yeah it does, I left out December 21st. December 4th, the sun sets at 447, and that's the latest, that's the, that's the earliest sunset all year long. That's the earliest, there's like three days when it sets at like 447, and that's the earliest it goes. And I accidentally erased my line that said December 21st, which is the solstice. December 21st is the shortest day of the year. Two to three days after that, three or four days after that, we have Christmas. But that's the least amount of sunlight that we have all year. And then slowly, at first, it starts getting just a little bit longer. 
and then the pattern repeats itself going the other way. It just happens two and a half, you know, one or two and a half minutes a day, but over a period of a couple of weeks, it's like, boy, this is, I, it's dark outside now. I get home from work, I could go outside and play in the yard with my dog, but now it's dark. Now it's dark. And I want to go to bed. I want to go to bed as soon as it gets dark. <laughs> Sometimes I do. <laughs> what this does to our brains... What, the, what this does to our brains, here's this little thing called the pineal gland. And the brain scientists call this the master gland. The pineal gland, the pineal gland really is the on and off switch for all kinds of things that happen in our brain and our nervous system. And once we start losing that daylight, and there's just not as much direct sunlight hitting our body, the pineal, gla the pineal gland starts producing more of a, neuro a neurotransmitter substance called melatonin. The pineal gland, as soon as we start losing daylight, the pineal gland starts pumping out more and more melatonin. The pineal gland uses another chemical substance called tryptophan to make the melatonin. Where else do we get tryptophan? Turkey. 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 And once you eat that big Thanksgiving meal, what do you want to do? Sleep. Go to sleep. Because, because our brain is taking that tryptophan and turning it into our melatonin, and melatonin makes us want to go to sleep. Melatonin makes us drowsy. So, because the light is decreasing, we have more and more of this substance that makes us want to sleep. And this is probably the thing that makes seasonal affective disorder its own special kind of thing. <clears throat> okay, so, you don't even have to make, you don't have to have the most severe expression. But you know, it's like, okay, through the fall, I'm having less energy, and maybe I'm not feeling as good. You know, maybe, maybe I'm not having as good a time, maybe, maybe even I've taken it out on my loved ones. What can we do? And uh, I, I, I hope that I'm setting up Dr. Navarrete. Um, I think I am. I'm, I'm going to probably give a couple of things that uh, will uh, be precursors for that. But really, um, and, and going, I, I could arrange this a little bit differently. It's really from things that we try first to things that we try later if we really are feeling really bad and it's not getting better. Light, diet, exercise, possible use of melatonin supplements, possible use of antidepressants. And so right now I want to say you're going to see something in the slides over and over again and that is ask your MD. I'm not an MD. I have a PhD in psychology but I'm not a licensed psychologist. So you know any of these changes that you might make and especially if it's uh, being very troublesome to you you know talk to a nurse practitioner or a doctor or somebody because uh, I don't want you to hurt yourself. I don't want you to hurt yourself. Let's talk about, okay, and, and here I said we would talk more about depression. First is rule out other depression. Rule out other depression. You know, if, if it's something that happens throughout the year, it's not seasonal affective disorder. If you're, if you're checking off five of those things on the list of signs and symptoms and it's happening early in the fall, late summer, or in the spring, it's not seasonal affective disorder. And, you know, it's one of those things 
that lots of people... I'm sorry that I didn't put up a slide for like really how many people suffer from or encounter depression. Because it's a really large number. And um, so many times our desire is to be able to snap ourselves out of it or talk ourselves out of it. But if you or somebody you know who's you know is having weeks long periods of feeling bad, you or they deserve to like try to get some assistance. Because honestly, it really is not something that everyone can just bring themselves out of. It's it's just not. It's it's part of uh, it's it's part of the human experience um, that we wish that we could avoid, but not all of us can. So, if you've got enough of those signs and symptoms, find somebody, um, because there's some things that we can do, and uh, it really truly is suffering. Okay, now that we've talked about, make sure you're taking care of yourself or the people you love. And make sure it's not a more serious form of depression. Let's say you've, you're checking off just a couple of these things that you can do. This one is funny. This one is odd. When I was, when I was in school studying psychology, nobody was talking about this. <clears throat> but in terms of, of that brain biology that we just talked about, it, it makes perfect sense. You can get lights. You can get lights. It's called phototherapy. And your regular indoor light bulbs are not going to do it. Because what, what the first thing we try to do is fool our brain into thinking that it's still late summer. And you have to get a really bright bulb. I've, I've never purchased one of these myself, and it's funny to talk about it in this room, but a couple of times I've hit the tanning booths. I don't, I don't like the orange way it makes white people look. <laughs> but, but it made me feel a little bit better. Um, if, if you've got the money to invest, and they're not terribly expensive, you can go online and look for SAD Light Therapy, SAD for Seasonal Affective Disorder, and you find a bunch of different alternatives at different price ranges, and they need to be between 2,500, uh, that should actually say 10,000 rather than 1,000. 10,000 is preferable, and that's really bright. But if, if you get one of these really bright lights, the recommended dosage is just about 10 minutes. Just shine it on your face for about 10 minutes in the morning, not at night, because that's going to that's going to mess up your sleep schedule. But first thing in the morning, look at you know, put on your dark glasses so it doesn't hurt your eyes, and let that light go through your skin and into your brain and and tell your brain turn down the melatonin. Um, for people who really couldn't tolerate that bright a light, a uh, 2500 lux bulb, um, if you can you know, hang out under it for two hours or more. Uh, and people who get held by this say, usually it's just within a few days, I can tell. I'm feeling better. I've got a friend who uses this, and it helps him out a great deal. Um, here's where I'm, I'm setting up Dr. Navarrete. Uh, diet. So we we all know you know we just got through that great Thanksgiving dinner with the turkey and the stuffing and the gravy and the mashed potatoes and the sweet potatoes and the broccoli and cheese and the cornbread and the rolls and 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 then we all like went to sleep and woke up hours and hours later um, and. Even though, even though we love to eat that stuff and we call it comfort food, that's not really the very best stuff for us at, at, at if we're having this particular challenge, if we've got some sort of seasonal affective disturbance. 
what we really want is foods that are high in omega-3 fatty acids. Salmon is my favorite. Salmon is my favorite. But mackerel and herring also. Um, if we can't get to the seafood, then cooking things in olive oil, making, uh, you know, having stuff with walnuts, flax seed products give us that omega-3 fatty acid. Um, fresh meats and vegetables, fresh. Fresh meats and vegetables, not the stuff out of the can or out of the freezer, um, but fresh, so, you know, fresh fruit. Uh, and maybe especially cabbage and beets because it's got that particular B vitamin that uh, is associated with depression resistance. If you can't get it through your diet, then you can go to the drugstore and get a, an omega-3 supplement. And I said, talk to your MD. I think that's probably the least dangerous thing. Uh, and I don't think any of them are particularly, well, they can be. Uh, any of the other recommendations, especially as we're, you know, older. Um, so, diet would be number two. And then exercise. And, and really, when I'm, I'm talking to a crowd that uh, is uh, dealing with aging, um, I know that I'm not talking, you're not going to be running laps. Um, and, and uh, you know, my mom, my mom is uh, 82, and she, uh, she just bending over to put something in the oven last February broke 11 bones in her right foot. Um, and and, and I, I give prayers of thanksgiving that she didn't break her hip. Um, but I just know that, you know, as we get older, we really have to be careful about that stuff. So I'm not talking about jumping jacks. I'm talking about just making sure that you stay somewhat physically active um, and a lot of times if we're feeling sort of depression or stress, that's the first thing that we stop doing, which is too bad because it's one of the best natural things that we can do for ourselves to avoid depression. It's easy to quit doing in the winter months when there's less light and we can't get outside as much. Um, if you're coming from a full stop, it's just always good um, when you're choosing the exercise that's right for you to talk to your MD or your nurse practitioner or a physical therapy person or somebody who's really able to evaluate you and come up with stuff that's at the right level of activity, but making sure that you remain physically active. Um, you know, the exercise ball, it's again like the exercise ball is not particularly challenging, but I don't want you to fall off and hurt yourself. And if you've got grandkids who have a Wii, maybe you can do the Wii Fit, but don't trip because you're getting up and down off the little board. And uh, I was really surprised at myself because I didn't have a slide for Tai Chi. Um, because uh, I've been doing that for years, and my teacher uh, is really all about working with people all across the lifespan. You know, my teacher's. Um, are really about that for health. And uh, I might talk with Ms. Jenkins about maybe um, getting one or two of them to come talk to you at, at some point in the next few weeks because uh, they're good folks and it's good stuff. And it's gentle. <clears throat> the next up the list would be melatonin supplements. And now we're talking about like I'm really having a hard time feeling better and I've been going on for several weeks. You should talk to your doctor. Because you can hurt yourself with melatonin supplements. Um, if, if, if you've got depressive symptoms and it's not the seasonal affective depressive symptoms, then taking melatonin can actually make you feel worse. And remember that what's happening is the brain is making more melatonin. So why would we take extra if it's seasonal affective disorder, and that has to do with our, our sleep schedule. So if your MD thinks that you're a good risk for melatonin supplements, then the recommendation will be to take them in the middle of the afternoon. 
because that's the time that that's going to help reset your sleep schedule. If, if somebody's prone to seizure disorders or disorders that involve a lot of bleeding, melatonin's not good for you. So this is down the list of this is something that you should try the other things first and make sure you talk with a medical professional before you do it. Because again, I don't want you to hurt yourself. And then finally, the, the most, you know, the last, the last thing that we would want to do would be to try some antidepressants. Uh, which require a prescription from an MD or an osteopath. Um, they are relatively safe and effective for many individuals, and uh, they don't help everybody, but the people they do help, they often help a great deal. Um, if you and if you were to, you or somebody you know were to get a prescription for antidepressants, uh, your MD should tell you if you start to feel worse, Come talk to me immediately, because that can happen sometimes. Um, but I think you know that for most of us, that we're we're just not going to for seasonal affective uh, depression or disturbances, we're just not going to get to that point. Probably, um, we ought to be able to uh, help ourselves out with stuff that's uh, less major. And you know, just I, I'm happy to see that everybody is here today interested in taking care of themselves. And uh, you know, again, the depressions uh, and anxiety really. What 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 more do we want out of life than to enjoy it as we're moving through it and enjoy the company of our friends and loved ones and. Uh, if someone's feeling bad for a long period of time, we would like to help them try to do something to make that feel better. Thank you so very much. At this time, we will open up for questions. So we will start with uh, Kansas City. Kansas City? Kansas City, do you have any questions? Their screen is frozen. Let me try to call them back. They're frozen. Oh, yes. Yes, we have time. There we go. <laughs> go ahead. Anybody else got a question? No, we don't. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Justice City, are there any questions? I have a question. Okay, so you, you spoke, Dr. Johnson, of the melatonin that um, a gland in your brain creates. Is that, and it sort of resurfaces or sort of regenerates itself, the melatonin, when you're asleep? Or, uh, I guess my question is, um, to sort of, for this melatonin to regroup or regenerate or whatever it does in its brain, um, is it interrupted as when you're asleep and a light comes on? Say like a bathroom light or a hall light that you've left on? Because um, I've heard that um, this, uh, whatever it is that regenerates with your sleep cycle, if you turn a light on, it will stop regenerating. Or does that have anything to do with this? or? I'm not sure. This, uh, by the way, Dr. I'm going to. I'm going to. Yes, ma'am. Before you answer, uh -huh. restate her question because everyone okay. could not. Know. She has a soft voice. Okay. And everyone may not have heard her. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll try to remember it. I'll try to remember it. <laughs> um, does uh, a light going on when someone is asleep? Uh, uh, Interrupts the melatonin cycle. Is that basically? Yes. Basically. Yes. And and that question comes from uh, Michelle Schnur, who's uh, the secretary in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. So if you've got grandkids or great grandkids 
at Lincoln, they might run into her, and I told her to go see the presidential candidate, and she came to see this instead, and now asked a question that I don't really know the answer to. As stated. Um, no, I think that it, it is true that... Uh, so I, I, my mission is accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is my boss. Yeah. Um, I, I take actually, if you, if you want good sleep, uh, and we've got so much stuff, we've got artificial light, we've got television, we've got radio, um, if you want good sleep, uh, and you're having trouble sleeping, it's, it's good to start turning that stuff off 30 or 40 minutes before you get in bed. If you have trouble sleeping, then going to sleep with the television on is, is, is generally not a very good idea. And if you get waked up in the middle of the night and you turn on a light, like what if we have to go to the bathroom? It's, if you can get by with night lights and without turning on the light, it, you'll probably get back to sleep better. Okay. Um, I don't know how that really relates to the melatonin. Okay. Um, and actually, as I was prepping for this yesterday, I was trying to understand exactly why it was. I was trying to understand exactly the explanation for why it was that we should take the melatonin in the middle of the afternoon. And I just wasn't getting it. So I said, well, I'll just, I, I feel confident that that's when you should take it. So that's what I'll tell them. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'll, yeah. and also, and I know you're going to know the answer, answer to this question, um, who coined the phrase? Seasonal affective disorder. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I may, it may have been somebody, Levy, L-E-V-Y, because that's one of the first names in the, the history of publication, but I, I don't know. Is it kind of a North American phenomenon, or is it... Well, I think Southern... Well, no, I think it's like a Northern... La no, northern American Southern Latitudes. To, not, okay. not necessarily just a North American phenomenon. Okay. Michelle, I, somebody else has a question. So. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a grandson who had to take melatonin to get to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Would that be seasonal affective? Uh, that's some other condition. Um, the question was, a grandson takes melatonin to help sleep at night, and would that be seasonal affective disorder? Um, and I don't necessarily think that it would. I don't necessarily think that it would. I think that would be probably some other kind of sleep disturbance. And um, you know, the medical people will say, give give this a try because it does it does trigger drowsiness in sleep. Yes, ma'am. I'm a light sleeper. Uh-huh. Does does it mean that I have what would I? What would you recommend um, that I do? Sometimes when I go to bed, it takes me a long time uh -huh. to sleep. Uh -huh. Even the light from the from the street right. bothers me. Right. And I have I started doing some stretching uh -huh. before I go to bed, but I don't really know how what extent that uh, can be helpful. I would really probably do the exercise in the morning rather than in the evening. Um, I, I used to have a lot more... I, I might talk with um, somebody medical about maybe using melatonin if you're feeling like you're not getting enough sleep. Uh, I, I, for a while, had problems with uh, waking up about, you know, between 3 and 4 and not being able to get back to sleep. And uh, some people will get up and turn on a light, and I don't think that's the recommendation. That's not the recommendation in the literature. And uh, if, if you do any kind of meditation, even just paying attention to your breathing, I think it's better to, to stay there and drowse and try to just breathe deep than it is to get up and move around because sometimes, you know, we get our deepest sleep earliest in, in the evening. We get our deepest sleep after we first go to sleep. And it's that later in the morning sleep that as we get older, we, we don't get as much of. But it's really the first three or four hours 
um, that we get the deepest sleep and the sleep that we need the very most. And you're talking about I'm having trouble getting there. Um, I don't know. I might check. I might check a medical person and see. You know, should I try some? Should I try some melatonin? It's good to have a going to bed ritual. You're talking about stretching. It, it's good to, you know, all right, here's the things I do when I'm going to bed. Turn off the TV. Um, and, and just so can I get into a habit of I'm going to sleep now. You bet. Dr. Yes, ma'am. I did the music. Quiet music will help you to go to sleep and quiet down. Is that it? I think that that depends on the person. I certainly loud stuff doesn't. Um, I, do you use that? No. Anybody? Does anybody use that? Quiet music. I do. You do? Okay. Quiet music. Um, and and you know that gives us something that gives us something to to pay attention to without having to think really hard about it. And that's an important part of the going to sleep process, is uh, is that our real concentrated thoughts. You know, if you're thinking really hard about something, it's going to be difficult to go to sleep, and, and it, that shows up in the brain. That's in the brain activity. Uh, so, I think it works for some, but maybe not for everybody. I can't do it. Yes, ma'am. Overall, are you saying in the case where you're getting this extra pumping of this melatonin, mm -hmm. is are you saying the key things to try to really balance it out during the winter time? Yes, the key thing is to balance it out. Now. You know, and so for instance, and, and this is what I was really trying to understand. It's like, why if we're making more melatonin, does taking melatonin yeah. help? Exactly. And and I can't tell you as exactly as I would like to, but it has to do with how melatonin regulates the sleep cycle and the time of day that the brain is, is producing most melatonin. So what I was reading, I was really understanding it to be saying that it's the, it's the late sunrise that causes the problem. It's the late sunrise and the brain's reaction to the later sunrise mm -hmm. that really causes the problem. Okay. And so, in order to rebalance that schedule, it's a middle of the afternoon dose. And again, if it's not seasonal affective depression, if you've got a other depression, then you don't want it because it's going to make you feel worse. I think so. For the sake of time, let's keep moving to the next site. St. Louis. Uh, yes, we have a, a couple of questions here. Um, I have a comment. I enjoyed this class. It reinforced the things that I had been doing. As you said, before you take the vitamins, talk to your doctor. I have a lot of incorporated into my prescript prescription line. And each one I had discussed with my doctor. My supplements, my omega-3, and uh, the others that I don't recall the name right now, but they all are in my chart. And when I go from doctor to doctor, they can see what I'm on. And it's been approved by my primary care doctor. When I had knee surgery, they put me on a medication that was destroying my good bacteria. And as you said in the, in the uh, seminar, the minute you have a problem, talk to your doctor. So I took it to my primary care doctor. So she changed the prescription and sent the doctor a note. And they went back. So I have really got a lot out of this class from my past experience with the vitamins. 
and other other things that you talked about. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're doing it right. I'm glad you're doing it right. Thank you. And, and it's gratifying, if I didn't tell you something that's brand new, it's gratifying that it, it fits with the other good information that you already have. Any more questions? Okay. Yes, we have one more question. With this light, if you know that the sunlight really makes you feel better, and you, uh, uh, when you say you can order this light from somewhere, can you get this light on your insurance or do a doctor have to prescribe the light or how do you get it? I, I do not know if it's covered by insurance. If, I'm, I'm hearing some people say no. Um, which, but, but it might be that if you've got the right plan, it might. But doctors do write prescriptions for this. I know that this is something that uh, you, can, you can do it for yourself, but also if you go to an MD or your osteopath, they can write the prescription, and I've seen some people say, no, my plan doesn't, but then a couple of people saying, well, I know of a couple of plans that do. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have more definite information for you. That, that's what I wanted to know about the light, because I know as a person, I know that sunlight keep me up. Yeah. When it start getting dark, I, know I still stay upbeat, but... I would really feel better if I had more sunlight. Boy, the people, the people that those lights make a, a difference for, it makes a really marked difference for them. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm just sort of wondering if there are health centers, et cetera, that, that might have them. I don't know. They're, that would be worth trying to get done. Thank you, St. Louis. Let's keep moving down to Sykeston. Uh, Tyson doesn't have any questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Sykeston. Thank you, Sykeston. Lyrburn, I don't think we ever connected. They probably may be able to hear us, but we will not be able to hear them. That has happened before. But let's try again. Lyrburn, are you connected? Well, let's keep going. <laughs> Carl uh, Rothersville. <laughs> yes, we do have one question. Thank you, Sir. Uh, hello? Go ahead. Can you hear us? Yes, we oh, can. Okay. It was a concern of purchasing melatonin over the counter, the um, negative and the positive. And at this time, I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to Miss Gloria Amaton. Okay, my question is that it, you can purchase it over the counter, but how do you know, you know, if it's right for you because, you know, I know they said it's good for you if you have a problem sleeping, but also in the discussion you talk about the negative side. So then, you know, we don't know whether we should or should not, even if the doctor recommend it because it's even though it can cause other problems if you take it. And, and that's exactly why I, I said, you know, um, make sure if, if you want to try that out, make sure you talk with the doctor first. And, and, and the first couple of things that should be ruled out are, A, that you're not, you're not suffering from a more general depression. Um, B, that uh, you don't have any seizure or bleeding disorders. So if you're, you and your MD, you know, she or he does a, a good history on you, should be able to say, yes, this would be okay for you, or no, I wouldn't try that. Um, and, you know, again, since I don't have a license to practice medicine, I'm, I'm certainly not telling anybody to go do this themselves, just as a, this is an option to take with your doctor if, if the diet and the exercise um, and the light don't help you out. But, you know, as a couple of people have noted, if you're having sleep problems in general, um, then a doctor might write you a prescription for melatonin. Even though you can take it over the, over the counter, I think it's just wiser to uh, check with your doctor before you do.
Does that that help? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Any more questions? No more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carruthersville. At this time, if there are not any, we have one more question. No, I have a comment. All right. I'm Go not ahead. being braggadocious. But thank the Lord, I am blessed with no sleep problems. I, I go to sleep. <laughs> so I'm not bragging. It's a blessing. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Blouse. Are there any more comments? At this time, please join me in a round of applause for our speaker. Sorry, I can't stick around for the rest, but I gotta go teach, teach my students. <laughs> 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 you can teach you a one thing or two to, to a five depression to with the parts. That's that's <laughs> what I'm sorry I'm gonna miss that because I will have it in a Oh I'm so sorry. Because I know you know your stuff. <laughs> At this time, this is an opportunity, of course, to complete your first evaluation and also to select a door prize winner from each site. So we probably will disconnect for about five minutes. So we can go ahead and select a door prize winner and we will reconnect in about five minutes. Don't disconnect. Don't disconnect? Just, please. So, don't. I was informed adamantly to not disconnect. <laughs> so we will not disconnect. Just mute. Yeah. Thank you.